Hey everyone, welcome to this edition of Weather or Not. I'm Chief Meteorologist Lee Goldberg, WABC TV, and this is actually an emergency weather or not because we saw the northern lights across parts of our area. Clouds hampered some viewers. We might have another shot tonight. I am a nut for the northern lights. I've traveled to see them in Iceland or northern New England. Where did I end up seeing them? On the Upper West Side of New York City. So it's so hit or miss, but we have a wonderful opportunity tonight, and they are so spectacular. So no one better to talk to than Marcelo Gueros of Columbia University, professor of astronomy. Thanks so much for joining us last minute, Marcel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. All right, so can you take our viewers through just 101 Aurora Borealis formation from the sun's activity to the Earth? Yeah, so the sun has a magnetic field. That magnetic field manifests itself in various ways. The sun's not especially active, but occasionally it cycles through act, uh, uh, magnetic activity. And probably the most obvious manifestation of that is sunspots. Those sunspots can generate these kind of ejections called these coronal mass ejections. And when that happens, you have this stream of particles that flies out into space. Uh, some of those particles will impact the Earth's magnetosphere. Generally, the Earth's magnetosphere protects us from those particles and they just get bounced out and we never see them again. Occasionally, though, the storm is strong enough that those particles will actually enter into our atmosphere and then they get funneled towards the poles, uh, the magnetic poles of the Earth, accelerated. And when they do that, they wind up heating up the nitrogen and the oxygen primarily in the atmosphere, causing those gases to light up. And so you get these beautiful colors that we see in these, uh, in these aurorae. And this plasma, I mean, this can travel at millions of miles an hour to the Earth. That's right. Yes. So it, uh, it, it takes a few days typically to get from the sun to us. But yes, these particles are traveling fast. Um, it is long enough that we have a sense of when they're coming and when they're likely to hit. So we can do a little bit of forecasting, uh, but it, we don't have a huge amount of time to prepare. Can you take me to the kind of revelation that, OK, we have something special happening on the surface of the sun and then the speed, time of travel, and when it typically would affect Earth after you observe that? Yeah, so they, these things move very fast. I mean, they're, they're uh, I forget exactly what the, the speeds are, but it takes a few days for them to get to us. So it takes light only eight minutes to get from the sun to us. So we can observe things that are happening on the sun much faster than we can actually uh, experience the particles. The particles travel more slowly than the light. Uh, so we typically have a few days before the, the, uh, the impacts occur, so to speak. Uh, the thing, though, is that the whole picture that, you know, we've been discussing is still, uh, it's still very impressionistic. That is, we don't really understand all the details of the mechanisms that are responsible for these ejections. And so we can't really predict them. And one of the goals of space weather, uh, the discipline of space weather, is to try to understand exactly the connection between what's happening on the surface of the sun, so things like star spots, these ejections, and then the interactions with things like the Earth's atmosphere. And that's a, a really interesting and very complicated uh, system that we're, we're, we need to understand because we have a lot of technology now in the atmosphere. We have uh, many things that can be interfered with by these kinds of events. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of very active research on this area. It's not just uh, sort of uh, something that we we look at passively and admire. It's also something we want to understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely observed that even on the NOAA Space Weather page, it was, I mean, it's pretty slim pickings years ago. And now, I mean, it's actively updating. I think we're getting better and better at it. And and obviously something like this is showing that, and, and even with the advent of just more and more social media, this just, um, you're seeing more pictures of the Northern Lights, you're seeing more observations. So that, that data must be helping us learn. Yes, and, and you're right to highlight NOAA's role in this. I mean, they have a, a space, uh, a, 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 an office that looks specifically at what's happening on the sun and helps us understand you know, what the consequences might be. Um, and you're right, I think there is a growing awareness of, of the phenomenon and it's driven largely, I think, by the fact that we just have many more satellites in space. Uh, and these, uh, these events do have real consequences. They can, they can mess with the communication systems, uh, both between satellites and between satellites on the Earth. And they can also impact the orbits of satellites and kind of push them down. And that, that, that's a problem. 
in in these in these solar uh, higher solar activity times, have we seen? I know that so many different fleets of satellites have been put up, you know, trying to establish um, you know, even internet in remote locations. Have we lost satellites with some of these CMEs? That's a good question. I wouldn't know for sure, but my guess is probably. Uh, okay. Just just statistically, I'm guessing that 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 does happen. Uh, and so it's part of the process of setting up those networks is having to, you, you kind of have to keep putting satellites back up to replace right. the ones that, that you lose. I will tell you that for things like NASA, NASA's telescopes, um, this is a consideration. This is one of the things that they have to worry about. And they, they will, some of, some of these satellites can correct their own, uh, they correct their orbits. Essentially, they can push themselves back up. Uh, but those that can't, you have to worry because eventually what happens is that as they start to fall in, they will, in fact, drop all the way. Like the friction with the atmosphere will cause them to sink towards the surface. Uh, okay. So, all right. uh, so let's get into the good stuff now. Yeah. Um, the solar particles reach the Earth's, um, you know, magnetic field. Yeah. What happens then that translated into these spectacular kaleidoscope of lights? Yeah, so that's also an active area of research because we don't fully understand how the how the energy transfer occurs. But the the simplistic picture I would have is that you know you sort of have this this wind of particles that's slamming into our magnetic field. Most of the time, the the magnetic field acts like a shield and sort of just deflects them away. But if the storm is strong enough, some of those particles will actually get into into our atmosphere. And the, and the magnetic fields in those cases kind of act like funnels. They'll sort of drive those particles towards the poles because that's where the magnetic field lines are open. The earth is like a magnet and the, the magnetic field lines are open at the north and south magnetic poles. And so there, these particles are being accelerated in that process and that causes them to have lots and lots of energy that they deposit in the gas. So they smack into the nitrogen and the oxygen and it, it's essentially heating up our atmosphere. And when the gas is heated up, how does it react? It reacts by cooling, and it does that by emitting these beautiful lights. So the nitrogen will give you uh, the kind of purplish and pink colors, and the oxygen will give you the kind of green colors, right? And those are the two main components of our, of our atmosphere, our nitrogen and oxygen. So that's what you're seeing, is that gas that's been heated up by these particles that have slammed into it, cooling down by emitting away some of this light. So I've been going on air and reporting the K index, the G level storm. Can you sort of give a little bit of understanding or explanation as to what those numbers mean? And as our viewers watch, they see a certain number that may be a guide as to what they might see. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is a kind of uh, normal human uh, desire is to classify right. things, <laughs> of course. Give, give it a number, like how, how bad is it, right? <laughs> and, so, uh, and so the G level, which is the thing I'm most familiar with, is it you know, gives you a sense of that scale. Uh, and a G4, which is the, the, I think the storms that happened yesterday were two of them. Yes. There's one that's happening right now. Those are all G4s. And so those are severe, right? And I actually don't know. I think G5 might be the highest, but I, you know, yes. I think these are these are intended to to also help uh, you know people who run communication systems, who run power grids, who run satellites uh, to to prepare. And and if we had any uh, astronauts in, in space, we would also want to sure. warn them because this is this is a unhealthy event if you're outside of the Earth's magnetosphere. Okay, so that we had that G4 last night. It looks like we're still in some G4, G3 conditions. I, I, that certainly, at least in, in terms of what I've observed, you get that G4, there's a shot in the, in the tri-state area for our viewership. And in fact, you know, of course, even farther, I think there was some observations in Mexico last night. Yeah, so yeah. as we go into tonight, if the CME, which seems to be happening now, and I don't know if it's been confirmed that it's actually hit Earth yet, um, is there a possibility that that can that strength can still last in the evening hours, kind of extend the window? Because we can't clear out until later on tonight. So I'm just hoping for those levels to be maintained so we get a shot again. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, this this is your business more than mine. <laughs> you know, the, the prediction business is a tricky one, right? <laughs> I, you know, we can only hope. Uh, you know, if if the conditions are good, then 
around on either side of midnight is supposed to be kind of peak time for observing them. Okay. But you need a clear sky, obviously, and you need you need a dark space. And both of okay. those things can be a little tough to come by in the tri-state area. And you could also get, this could be classified as the G4, but it also has to come in at the right angle as well, right. correct? Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a there's a bit, well, I got, if you're big enough, I suspect that that you don't have to worry that much about that, but but okay. it's hard to tell. So what I would suggest is I think that you know you're right that social media helps a lot here. There are, there are some citizen science uh, efforts. Uh, that there are places on the internet that can help tell you whether people are are spotting this nearby, and that would be that would be my guide because you you kind of need a you know a minute by minute accounting here. Like this far ahead of time is is sort of tricky to to do much with. Right. So, so listen, we can we can give them some base expectations, but it is it's, it's very much now casting when you get into this, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, you mentioned the the sort of height of, of the solar cycle that we're in right now. How much longer will that window extend? Uh, good question. So I think we're on the we're on the downside of that. Right. Um, so I, my understanding is that we expect solar activity to be still pretty significant for the next few months. So it's okay. we're still kind of in that peak. And then it will slowly decline as the sun quiets and then goes back into uh, into. So, uh, so yeah, I guess that's one one maybe good piece of news here is that if we can't see right. it tonight, it wouldn't be crazy to expect that there will be more of these, maybe for better or for worse, depending on, <laughs> on how you look at this. But uh, over the next over the next few months. Um, I don't know if you personally have, have done some photographing of the northern lights or some observations. Any tips to seeing them? Obviously, we want to get away from the light pollution of New York City, but anything you might recommend? So your 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 phone is a better capturer of the northern lights than you are. I mean, just because of the wavelength sensitivity that it has relative to your eye. Uh, mm -hmm. So the the main suggestion is just to try and take some pictures with your phone because it will pick up details that your eye is not so sensitive to. Otherwise, you know, whatever. Uh, whatever luck you've stored for the year, like try to try to bring that with you. <laughs> <laughs> and just one last question before I let you go in terms of the research um, yep. of the of the auroras. Um, what, what's been sort of the most recent findings? What we, maybe we are we close to in terms of the goals of research in this that may help with further prediction? Yeah, so there, there are lots of ways to answer that question. I mean, one of them is that, of course, we see auroras on planets. Uh, outside of Earth, so uh, we're seeing them. Uh, we've been seeing them for a while on other planets in the solar system, but we're now starting to see evidence for them um, for on objects outside even the solar system. So you know, other planets in the solar system, but also planets and planet-like objects far away from us also seem to have aurorae. So they seem to be like a fairly universal phenomenon when you have magnetic fields. Um, one of the interesting things is that you can you see cases where it's not a star interacting with the planet uh, that creates the aurora, but it could be something like a moon, like you could have a, a transfer of, of energetic particles from a moon to the planet that causes the aurora. So that's what we think happens on Jupiter, for example. But we also are now seeing evidence with JWST of this happening uh, on brown dwarfs. Um, so there's some really interesting extensions of aurorae outside of the solar system now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, the other thing I would say, um, and this isn't my field, so I don't want to misrepresent this, but I think we're, we, we're understanding a little bit better how the energy is actually transferred from these particles entering into the atmosphere uh, mm -hmm. into the, 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 uh, uh, the atmospheric gas. Uh, and that there was a, a mystery there about how the acceleration occurred. So we, you know, I said the, the particles slam into the magnetic field, they get past the magnetic field into the atmosphere and they're accelerated. But you know, how, right? Like what's doing that? And uh, I think we understand now that there's there's some wave phenomena that are kind of responsible for accelerating those, those, uh, those particles. They kind of catch that wave and that gives them that extra boost of energy that they're then depositing into the into the atmosphere. So, you know, there are lots of ways in which this this ties into various active areas of research, which is great. And it bridges into to, to my field as well as we look yeah. at solar science for sure for analogs with particular weather patterns. So it's all interconnected and fascinating for me. One other thing, any other celestial highlights that you wanted to promote moving forward over the next month here as we head toward the solstice? Ooh. 
next month uh next month that's uh, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is that we're going to have another solar eclipse um yes. in august of, of next year it won't be visible from the united states unfortunately but i know plenty of people who saw the eclipse um last spring oh. and were thrilled by it and if they can afford to travel uh this one will be visible in spain uh august 13th I guess it comes down from Iceland and goes through Spain. Yeah. So I know a lot of people who've become suddenly really enthusiastic about seeing eclipses. So oh that's my the one I put on the calendar. Marcel, I was in Burlington, Vermont, and when totality happened, it was, I mean, I can't even, it's one of the I mean, like lights. I would say that's the other one. You know, you were talking about like spectacular phenomena that kind of remind you that you live on a planet that's interacting yes. in a system with, a, you know, eclipses on the northern lights are, I think, the two really spectacular examples of that. Marcel, can I turn to you again as we uh, can finish up this, you know, uh, Max and Solar Cycle? I I'd love to talk to you again on another weather or not. I'd be happy to, absolutely. All right, thanks so much. Marcel Aguero is professor of um, astronomy at Columbia University. This has been great information. Certainly will help our viewers. And good luck tonight. Hopefully we see some more. Yes, good luck to everyone. All right, thanks. Thank you. And that is this edition of Weather or Not. We will keep you posted on our daily forecast and tell you what solar activity is like, what, uh, of course, now you know the G levels are like for the storms. And, of course, you'll find every night that every night with your exclusive active weather forecast. Thanks so much for listening to this edition of Weather or Not. Thank you.